Hey, Kev, let's let's follow this trail over here. This looks like there might be something waiting down there. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Do you hear that? Yeah, I thought it was just me. What the heck is that? I don't know what that is. Whoa, do you smell that, too? That's unbelievable. Hey, look. What the? Hey, look, those, those branches are moving over there. What the heck is that? Holy cow, is that what I think it is? Look at that thing. Think it, oh my god. It's a freaking Sasquatch. Welcome to the Bigfoot Terror in the Woods Sightings and Encounters podcast. I'm your host, W.J. Sheehan. Hello, everybody, and once again, welcome to our show. My name is W.J. Sheehan, and I am the author of a series of books entitled Bigfoot Terror in the Woods Sightings and Encounters, all of which are available at Amazon in ebook and paperback format. And if you're an audiophile, you like to listen on the fly, you can get volumes one through six at uh, Audible, iTunes, and Amazon as well. Sorry for my little stutter there. And now, may I welcome to the show my co host and brother. KJ Sheehan. Kev, how are you, brother? I'm good. I thought you might have stuttered because you looked out the window and saw a big dog man ears <laughs> peering in. Yeah, dog man was nibbling on my great toe. <laughs> <laughs> that would make me stutter. <laughs> hey, Kev, you know, uh, before we get going tonight in our cryptids in the news and other oddities segment, Maybe you could just explain to the listeners uh, the posting of pictures on our uh, webpage. It's been a little uh, couple of people inquiring, where are the pictures, where's this and that. Maybe you could just explain to them how sure, you sure. go about that. Yeah, so if you go to our website, BigfootTerrorInTheWoods.com, uh, one of our sections, the main section really is called Episodes. And in there, you'll see a listing of every episode we've done. 80 so far. Uh, and um, after each one, it'll give a little description of the uh, episode and where we have something to post. You know, not every episode has videos and or images posted with it, but a lot of them do more and more every every day now. Uh, but if you go there under each episode, as you read the text right below the text, you should see uh, either photographs or YouTube videos or a combination of the two. And then the other location, a different tab entirely from episodes, is called Fun Stuff. And we just added that probably about a month ago, and we just put some random fun stuff in there that might not have anything to do with an episode, but it's something folks ask that they'd like to see. Uh, you know, like some people ask to see pictures of some of the model airplane warbirds that I've been building during the uh, pandemic. Uh, so I put some up there and then some funny memes and that that Bill and I come across and some of our listeners send in too. We post there and we'll continue to do that. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, and again, you know, if you have something to contribute, don't be shy. There's no reason to be shy. Kevin and I don't bite, at least tonight anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I may change my mind by the end of this podcast. <laughs> But uh, if you got something interesting or cool or even humorous, you send it in, you know, and as long as it's not trashy, we'll uh, decide whether or not we're going to post it. But uh, don't be afraid. If you've seen something, say something and contact us ASAP. Yeah, and so, it could be you could take a picture of yourself next to uh, your favorite Bigfoot sculpture uh, in your backyard, <laughs> town, whatever. And uh, if you want, we can put that up in fun stuff as well. Hey, you know, Kev, uh, speaking of Bigfoot sculptures, I'm surprised that nobody has sent in a picture of like a, a Bigfoot snowman. <laughs> you know, I haven't seen anybody make a Bigfoot snowman. No, I haven't. Uh, I haven't either. Yeah, it's got to come from a place, though, where people get substantial snow and good for uh, 
packing, you know? Well, he's got to be like 10 feet tall, right? <laughs> yeah, they're out there with a huge stepladder finishing <laughs> off his head. <laughs> That's awesome. So what do you got tonight, bro, in our Cryptids in the News and Other Oddities segment? Yeah, so tonight we are going to the news, and it was only uh, maybe a week or so ago. On December 29th at 8.30 in the evening in the state of Hawaii on the island of Oahu, uh, a lot of different people saw what they believe is a UFO. Wow. And have you seen any of these videos? Kev, I have to tell you, it's the first I'm hearing about it. All right. Well, don't worry. It wasn't that long ago, but these are super cool. And, uh, you know, the net of it is a bunch of people saw the same thing. They reported the same thing. So people were calling the police, calling the airport, stuff like that. And there's some great video footage that, again, I will post with this episode on BigfootTerrorInTheWoods.com. So, and it lasted, like the the main sighting lasted a long time, you know, probably 10 minutes or so. And people have, you know, these long 10-minute video clips of it. Wow, so it's and pretty cool. Nobody reported uh, seeing a bear? <laughs> no, but we will get to a funny, you know, the, uh, the classic funny explanation for what they saw. All right, yes. But well, first I'll take you through the accounts, okay? So... So um, the, the, some of the folks that reported to uh, the local newspaper and the local news on the Hawaiian island of Oahu, uh, they reported a large blue unidentified flying object spotting, spotted flying across the sky, okay? And um, it was like this, if you could imagine a hot dog, like the shape of a hot dog, colored blue, and it's flying across against the black sky pretty slowly. Again, multiple folks took a picture of it, but it was illuminated with this blue color, right? Mm -hmm. It's pitch dark, 8.30 at night, and um, they see it flying along. They get in the car. They go after the thing out to the coast, and then they see it disappear into the ocean, which, you know, me as a, a boating guy... Maybe it didn't disappear into the ocean. It might have gone over the horizon as well. Yeah, it's hard to tell how far you're looking. You have no, no, especially you're, when you're looking into blackness at this blue glowing thing. Right? Yeah, and you have no idea how big it is. No idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But well, it's, you know, it doesn't have to be that far away to go over the horizon, right? So, and this this thing was like kind of boomerang shaped. It was kind of like a curved hot dog, I would say. So not okay. a full boomerang, uh, just kind of like a little bit of an arc and thin like a hot dog. That is a weird shape, man. It is a weird shape, yeah. And, and nothing this one woman, so she, uh, she reported it to Hawaii News Now, or they call it HNN on the island, I guess. Um, Mariah, uh, at age 38, she said, I looked up and I was like, oh... S blank, blank, blank. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she said, I started calling my husband and them, I guess the rest of the family, because they were all in the garage. I was like, hey, come look up here. See if you see what I see. And they all said, yeah. You know, which you could imagine, Bill, right? Like uh, if we were having a little family get together and I happened to be out in the street at 830 at night and you were in the garage there with the rest of the folks, and I look up and I see this thing. I'm like, first thing I'm going to do is say, hey, come over here. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? You know, yeah. what, what is that? Are my eyes playing a trick on me? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, absolutely. And uh, you know something, Kev? Uh, my daughter, Danielle, was over for uh, Christmas time. Guess what she saw? Mm. She saw what you're describing. Get out of here. Yes, sir. Right here over Long Island. <laughs> and you know me. I'm always one to begin the conversations about Bigfoot or anything else. <laughs> and uh, I did so again that night. And the result of that conversation was Danielle. Now, I'm not saying that she wouldn't have mentioned it. Right. But after I began the conversation, she said, well, you know, 
No, I don't know. Pray tell. Tell me. So this is the point I always make about stimulating the uh, various topics to see what other people may blurt out with. Yeah, yeah. So get this. This woman, Mariah, which, by the way, she says flat out, I've never been a big believer in UFOs. Um, But as they're all seeing this, that, you know, it was her and her husband that reported they got in their car to follow this thing. Mm. Right. As it's moving across the sky. And she described it, interestingly enough, as being larger than a telephone pole and said she never heard it make any sound. Mm. So she called 911 to find out if the police had any answers. They get out to the coast and uh, without before the police arrive and this blue thing goes into the ocean, as they describe it. But like I said, it might have gone over the horizon. So they're sitting there. The police arrive on the scene and then they all spot a second light similar to the first one. But it was white in color and it appeared to be a little bit smaller. Hmm. And she said after after a few miles, they lost sight of it as it passed behind over and behind a nearby mountain. Wow, that's really interesting. I, I'm I'm a little confused. You know, descriptions are just that descriptions. Uh, the the notion of it being about the size or bigger than a telephone pole. I wonder yeah. if she was using that as like a, a measurement to her eye in the distance with like her fingers or something. Yeah, that, of course it doesn't say, and I don't know how. You know, but I mean, it's a a guesstimate. You know, yeah, like yeah. You, you or I might say the same thing, and somebody could say to us. Well, how do you figure it was as big as a telephone pole? Wow, you know. Yeah, that's uh, one of the weird things. It's like a sighting of a Bigfoot, right? I saw this, you saw that, but we both saw a Bigfoot. But, you know, I'll put the video clip up for sure. And, you know, when you look at it, you're looking at the video clip at least, which is not the same as seeing it in person. You have no idea how big this thing is. And like we said earlier, you have no idea how far away it is. Right. I mean... If they were looking at this thing and it was at sixty or seventy thousand feet, yeah, you that, don't know. That could have been extremely large. Could have been bigger than a bear. Bigger than a bear. Think about <laughs> it, people. <laughs> ah. So uh, the they, the the police apparently gave a report to the FAA. They called the FAA, the, the, the Federal Aviation Administration, at the local uh, flight center or airport, and they they reported what they saw, and they asked if there was a possibility of a plane being down in the area. You know, maybe that was what the blue thing was that they saw going into the water, but the FAA, and specifically a gentleman by the name of Ian Greger, reported that... Uh, you know, no aircraft, no reports of any aircraft disappearing uh, off of the radar and no reports of any overdue or missing aircraft. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Do you happen to know, Kev, off the top of your head, how far out are we looking when something would be uh, below the horizon of our viewing? Yeah, I got to look it up because there is a, uh, you know, it's a set amount of distance. I can't remember what it is, so. Right, right. But it's not that far. You know, like uh, I would say, I'm guessing now, people, so don't don't write me angry letters. You can congratulate me if I'm correct. I'm thinking it's like 30 miles or something like that. You know, you pulled the number right out of my head. I was thinking 30 miles. Yeah. And uh, that's very interesting. You know, uh, yeah, it's certainly not, you know, halfway across the Atlantic. No, no. That's what I'm saying. It's really easy for something to drop below the horizon. And in fact, that's why a lot of folks, even before the, uh, you know, the invention of a telescope and that, they believe that the the world was flat because they would see, they'd be watching a sailing ship go out of port and it would look like it would drop off of the edge as it <laughs> dropped over the horizon. <laughs> I mean, think about how silly that is, though, you know. Hey, you think it's silly. We'll have another episode on this. There's a whole modern-day group that still thinks the Earth is flat. Yeah, I mean, these people are freaking out of their <laughs> minds. I probably work with some of them. <laughs> <laughs> so I promised the crazy uh, exp- explanation of uh, what this is. Yeah. 
And um, somebody, you know, one of the uh, naysayers said that it looks a lot like an LED kite. And I was like, what the heck is an LED kite? You know, thinking it was something special. And all it is is a kite with like uh, some LEDs around it and a long tail that right. has LEDs along it. So like I looked up some videos on YouTube of LED kites, which I'll post one of those as well. And the the two are never going to be mistaken for one another. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, know, not, like, uh, not, not mistaken for a blue hot dog. <laughs> flying 70 or 80 miles offshore and disappearing below the horizon. Just just really something like, because I was like, oh, okay, what's this LED kite thing? I guess that's what it is, you know, before I decided I was going to uh, report on this. And then I looked at it, I was like, nah, that, that's not an LED kite. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's always got to be an explanation, right? Yeah. I, I don't know why that is. But there's always got to be some rational, known explanation for everything we see. Yep. yep. Uh, at, which is just mind-blowing in and of itself that nothing can be out of the box extraordinary. You know, everything has to be a freaking bear. <laughs> no, pr- no offense to the bears out there. We like you, but, you know, <laughs> I'm not a bear. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So the other interesting thing that I just wanted to mention briefly related to UFOs and, uh, you know, this uh, current uh, current age, this current year, past year. uh, It's interesting that there's a lot of articles out there that talk about how the UFO sightings are up significantly uh, during the pandemic, which, you know, the the logical explanation is, of course, we're all home you know, or or at least in our immediate area. And there's also a lot less aviation going on, you know, right. so it's easier to spot something weird as it's going across the sky. And that's pretty interesting. You know, like it's, I'm not saying that there's definitely more UFO activity, but it could be that we're all looking, you know, Bill, kind of like we always say, if you're, if you're not looking, you're definitely not going to see anything. That's right. And maybe some of these people have put their uh, iPhone down for 15 minutes each night and took a look at what's above them. I don't think that's going to happen. You don't think so? (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's always hope, bro. (laughs) And then uh, then one of the folks that in one of these articles that's reporting about it, it's pretty interesting from one of these UFO watching organizations. He, he had an interesting uh, uh, thought that he put up, and he said, you know, it's interesting. When you go into a room, and this gets back to your, uh, your conversation with Danielle, when you go into a room full of people, and if you ask them if any of them have seen a UFO, a fair number of hands are going to go up in the room. But then if you say to them, you know, something along the lines of, hey, leave your hand up in the air if you've reported the sighting of the UFO. And, you know, almost every hand in the room then goes down. Right, right. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, they just don't want to be associated with it. They don't mind telling you, I think I saw something. No, they're much more likely to talk about it when someone else says, hey, did you see that blue hot dog, you know, Tuesday night at 830? Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, I couldn't believe that. And then if you said to them, did you tell anybody? No, nah, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's the same way. It's the same way with uh, our friend, the Sasquatch. I bet you, Kev, I bet you in the United States alone, over a million people have seen a Sasquatch or heard a howl and never said boo about it. Tell you what, if I ever see one, I'm going to say something. <laughs> we might even have a special episode <laughs> whatever day that is so yeah. you know super cool just to recap so this happened tuesday night uh december 28th so between christmas and new year's eight thirty at night on the island of oahu so you know where like uh uh the uh, the old and the new hawaii 50 uh were and are filmed you know Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Book them, Dano. Book them, Dano. And a <laughs> bunch of different people around the island saw this, and some of them got some great video footage. 
And then, uh, you know, this one couple that went out to chase it and called the police. When the police came out, they all saw a second UFO of a different color but similar look. Yeah, very interesting. That one was white, right? Or White. Or- yeah, the first one was blue, right. and the second one was uh, more white. Yeah, I forget... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking now back in my conversation with Danielle, I'm almost wanting to say that the the one that she saw that she described was white or like off white, uh, some type of blurry. Uh, I, I don't know. But the important thing was the description was the same. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's weird. You know, uh, these things are flying around. Uh, our airspace, I say ours, it's everybody's, right? Uh, but they're getting around to all points of the compass. And uh, you can't tell me that none of this is being picked up by radar uh, around the globe. I don't know what that whole radar deal is. I'd like to see what happens inside of like an air traffic control center when something odd shows up on a screen. Yeah, I mean, you you know, remember we did the uh, Tic Tac UFO episode, uh, yeah. right? And they were saying that they on the the equivalent of a you know a flight control center that the Navy has on the water, right? On some right. of these big aircraft carriers, they're sitting there and they were looking at it and they saw it for several days, and they even like updated the software on the radar, rebooted it, you know. Yeah. Thought yeah. maybe it was birds, but it wasn't birds. So I'm sure it's similar, you know, like start start blaming the equipment, you know. Yeah, I mean, theirs may be a little better, but I'm not here to say that the stuff we're using for uh, uh, ordinary folk is like second rate, because that would be oh, ridiculous. Oh, no, I think, it's, I think it's the same stuff, yeah. you know, in my experience. I'm just saying that the first thing you start to do is kind of reboot the software, you know, turn mm-hmm. it on, turn it off. Check for some software updates, kind of like if, uh, you know, all of a sudden uh, an image of a Sasquatch appeared on your computer monitor walking across <laughs> the screen, you know, hypothetically. I'd be like, well, what is he uh, doing like, Wait a minute. And then you shut off the computer and it's still there. Yeah. Okay, looking that's at a problem. You. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then you say, how'd my mother-in-law get on here? <laughs> Reboot. Shut it off. <laughs> hey, wait, Bill. My mother-in-law listens to this podcast. <laughs> She's a nice lady. <laughs> well, I'm talking about somebody else's mother-in-law. All right, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's our story this week from the news. Very recently, up in the skies again, which I love. And Bill, what type of creature feature do you have for us today? Well, I tell you, I got a hair-raising tale uh, tonight, and uh, really, well, let me just get into it. There's no sense stalling, uh, (laughs) because the story in my introduction really tells it all. This encounter was told to me by Constantino Aiello, whose friends call him Tino. Having sat face-to-face with Tino... There's nothing tiny about him. He's about six foot eight and 275 pounds of beast. So in this case, it was Bigfoot versus Bigfoot in the Monongahela forest. My friend Reese and I are both veterans of the armed services. I being a former army ranger and Reese having served in the Marines. The two of us work out together, and we both enjoy some good outdoor hiking and adventuring whenever possible. During the second week of September in 2003, we had gotten together for a weekend of backpacking in a Monongahela National Forest region. It was early Sunday morning, having spent the night in our tent near the Gaudner Knob Scenic Area, that we awoke to a dense, soaking fog with visibility of only 100 feet at best. One more reason to bring a compass and to be familiar with your surrounds, 
was that there were ab- there was absolutely nothing to go by as far as far as landmarks or anything else was concerned. We were completely socked in by the fog, and who knew when it would lift? We prepared ourselves a little breakfast and decided to commence our hike through a predetermined trail in what are known as the Big Trees. This trail, even on a sunny day, presents a hiker with very limited visibility. The trail is narrow and rough, meandering about through the large trees and the lower forest within it. I can tell you that I actually felt that something was wrong that day as we began our hike. I only say this because it was the same feeling that I had one morning in Afghanistan when our patrol went out on recon and lost nine men in an ambush. We had our map and we knew where the trail would lead, providing there was, in fact, a trail to follow. If there was no trail, our compasses would keep us on course. As we entered the forest, the fog in the trees was like soup. Our visibility had lessened to well under 50 feet, if not less. There would be no running in here, for the trail was so rutted and root-infested that you could easily turn an ankle or worse just by walking and not paying attention. Having said that, we were walking with our heads down 50% of the time. There wasn't much to see in that we were in a cloud, with silhouettes of trees appearing and disappearing like ghosts. The forest was eerily silent in a way that only a hunter can describe. It was similar to being underwater, which is the way that I will describe it. I don't know if your listeners have ever heard a tree as it gives way and falls in the woods, but I have. There is generally a large crack as the trunk reaches its breaking point, which is followed by the crashing sounds of the tree smashing its way down through the neighboring trees, finding its way to the earth below. As I said to you, we were immersed in this deadly silence, when I heard the loud crack of a tree giving way to our right in the fog. Knowing what I was hearing, I grabbed Reese, pulled him behind a tree to our left, and told him to duck. We had no way of knowing how far away this tree was, how tall it was, and or in what direction it was falling. For all we knew, it could be coming down on top of us in a matter of seconds. The initial crack was followed by the thrashing and crashing of the tree falling through the canopy, ending with a loud thud as it met the ground. To me, it sounded very close to our position on the trail. Reese said to me, Damn, that was a close call, Tino. Thank God that didn't come down on top of us or we'd both be dead. We took a little breather to compose ourselves, and still the forest was quiet. I have to say that when the tree fell, something told me it was no accident. I have no way of quantifying what I just said, other than that was the way I felt in that moment. Having already told you about my feelings when we started off that morning. We had only been walking for maybe another 15 minutes when we heard some loud rustling and snapping of branches off to the same side of the trail that the tree had fallen. These noises to me sounded deliberate. In other words, something or someone had made them intentionally for us to hear. Reese and I had both stopped to listen as we slowly withdrew our knives. It was only a matter of seconds later that we started to hear what sounded like a large, heavy-footed animal stomping repeatedly on the forest floor. What we were hearing audibly reminded me in my mind's eye of an old western when the Indians were stomping around a fire going from foot to foot 
doing a war party dance. I mean no disrespect. I'm only trying to bring to life what I was visualizing and hearing. Now, you know, Bill, that I'm a big dude, and Reese is no slouch either. But to have all of this going on in close proximity and not being able to see anything had the two of us on edge. The stomping had stopped as abruptly as it had started. So we began to slowly move forward on the trail. At this point in time, it made no difference if we went forward or back. We couldn't see anything, and we couldn't move any faster in either direction. I think we had advanced maybe a hundred feet when a log came flying out of the fog and crashed just ahead of me on the trail. I had actually seen it come out. Whatever had thrown this could not have seen us either and was obviously going by instinct with the throw. The log was substantial in size and it could have easily hit us. This thing was now toying with us and Reese was pissed off. He shouted, Come out where, we can be, where you can be seen, you bastard! And we'll cut you down to size. Everything went eerily silent again. And both of us stepped off the side of the trail, grabbing some stout branches that we broke into a club shape. Now we each had a club and a knife. I can tell you right now, if a man had stepped out of the fog right then and there, we would have beat him to death on the spot without mercy or remorse. We were terrified, and we had moved perhaps another 50 feet when we heard a grunt. It was very deep and resonating. Whatever had made the sound was large and definitely not a man. We were moving through what was a snake-like turn in the trail, and I couldn't see 15 feet in any direction. This was the worst of the fog yet that we had encountered. I distinctly remember looking to my right and then turning my head as I proceeded to take the next step forward when, in the very fringe of the mist, there stood a Sasquatch with the fog floating around it like a vision from hell. We saw it a second after me and we stood our ground shoulder to shoulder. I'm six foot eight and I was looking up at this beast like a basketball rim. The mist was wafting over its body like a veil, and its face had the expression that it was going to attack. It was the most intense and evil grimace I had ever seen. I would have to say that its shoulder width was at least five to six feet, and it was covered in wet hair that was clinging to its body. I can put up 450 pounds on the bench, and I felt insignificant in its presence. The two of us were bracing ourselves for the attack. My mind was rehearsing how I would slash and fight until we either prevailed or died right there in the woods. The three of us stood there face to face for about a minute, and then, with one quick step, the beast stepped back into the fog. We couldn't hear anything, and we were expecting at any moment an attack from any direction. For 20 minutes, we waited. It was during that time that the fog began to lift. We could actually see almost 100 feet around us, and the beast was nowhere in sight. We stepped up the pace and made it clear out of the forest double time. By the time we had cleared the timber, the sun was beginning to burn through the clouds, and for me it was like awakening from a nightmare. We collapsed in a field, neither being able to quite comprehend what happened. I was certain at the time when we had seen it that the situation was not going to have a happy ending for either of us. The Sasquatch certainly would have been cut up badly even if it killed us. 
Maybe it was capable of seeing that. We were facing it, <coughs> excuse me, with two large blades and clubs in hand. Perhaps if we had presented it with a less intimidating posture, we would have died. After all, this was the first time it had seen us as well as us seeing it. Its face was dark and wrinkled. The nose was flat to the face and broad. It seemed to be almost three or four inches wide. At one point, it seemed to grin, and I could see its upper fang teeth extending about halfway down into its lower bite. They weren't like a tiger's, but more like that of Dracula. Its arms and body looked like it was in a perpetual state of flexing. It was a living powerhouse of pure muscle and strength. Having now seen it for ourselves, we now believe that this monster had knocked a tree over initially to intimidate us. Whether it was half dead or not, we will never know, but it was most definitely a large tree. This we could tell by the noise that it made when it hit the ground. The earth actually shook the moment it made impact. Understand me, please. To me, this is a monster with no human origins whatsoever. Those who think otherwise are sadly mistaken in their beliefs. It is an animal of immense proportions and capabilities, and it is not to be taken lightly by anyone. What do you think of that, Kev? Whoa, that's a creep fest. Up in West Virginia. Freaking unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable is right. I mean, that's so many details, right? Yeah, well, you know, two pretty beefy dudes out doing their thing, you know, taking on the fog and the hike, you know. Yeah, veterans, you know. Yeah. Figuring, what the heck, we're out here, let's just go for it, you know. Macho man kind of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And then they encounter this thing in the freaking fog where you can't even see it. Oh, my God. How about his description of when they finally saw it? Yeah, with the and, fog around it. Right, and he says, I'm six foot eight, and I was looking at this thing like I was looking at a basketball rim. <laughs> that is one freaking big beast, boy. That is crazy. Also, uh, you know that description, right? We talk about it all the time where he says, uh, I, f I, felt, I just felt like there was something wrong when they were getting ready to start the hike. And uh, he said it was similar to the feeling he had in Afghanistan when, uh, you know, his uh, patrol went out and got ambushed and they lost a bunch of men. Yeah. Yeah. And that's again, see, this is when people override the natural God given instincts for protection. This is when the tr trouble begins. Yeah, you got to you got to trust it. If it feels wrong, there's something wrong. Yeah. Yeah, and people just figure, ah, you know, I'm a little antsy this morning, you know? Oh, yeah. And the next thing you know, you're in the middle of a life or death situation uh, that could have been avoided, you know? Yeah, with a nine-foot-tall, hairy man in the backwoods of West Virginia. Oh, my God. Yikes. You know, think of the power of these things. How many people have heard trees come down when they felt they were in the presence of these creatures? Yeah. Uh, the strength is immeasurable. Uh, oh, no I doubt saw, about it. I mean, geez. I saw, you know how people are always looking for the tree snaps? Yep. Uh, tree bends or snaps breaking in certain directions, and there are those who have theories as to what these breaks are. Uh, this one dude uh, had some pictures of trees. Now they weren't, I don't, I don't want to say trees. They were very small, like saplings, but let's just say an inch in diameter, one inch that were pulled apart. In other words, something grabbed one on the left and the right and yanked the fibers apart. Think about the power. You know, it, you know what it reminds you of, Kev? We were talking in the last episode about 
who could pull a half-inch climbing rope apart? Exactly. Right? Where the guys hung the meat up from the yep. moose? Yep. The same thing. This guy came across branches about an inch in diameter that were severed from each other by being pulled apart left and right. Mm. What the heck? What kind of... I don't even know how you measure that. Yeah, that tensile strength is... Uh... That's pretty strong. You know, you can you can break them with the sheer force, you know, over your knee, but pulling them apart. Uh, yeah, maybe folding them back and forth and yeah, twisting yeah. and turning them until finally they give way. But to yank them apart, mm-hmm. that is just like, uh, I mean, I was telling you the other day, I, I don't know if I'm repeating myself here or not, but folks, I was in touch with a, a woman, a listener. It's worth repeating. All of this stuff is worth repeating. Uh, she lives up near Buffalo, New York, and just one aspect of her Bigfoot encounters, uh, she had a fenced-in paddock where the uh, rails were nailed to four-by-four four post. all of this uh, treated lumber. She had these uh, spiral nails that are kind of curled like an elongated screw. The top rails of the fence nailed in with spiral nails were pulled off, no damage to the wood. And in some cases, the wood was pulled over the nail and the head to be removed. Mm. Think about that. That is just freaking off-the-chart power. Yeah. I don't know if that's measured in tonnage. It's definitely not measured in hundreds of pounds. No. It's some bizarre amount of... uh, of, uh, uh, strength required to pull off a maneuver like that. Mm. That's crazy, huh, Kev? Wild, man. Wild stuff. Yeah. You know, in that area, that area over there, that whole area of the Appalachians and the West Virginia backwoods and all of that area is just like rife territory. I mean, if you wanted to hide... That would be a damn good place to hide. When you when you ride up through West Virginia from here on, uh, I think it's I seventy seven. Man, you look to your right and to your left, and there's nothing. I mean, some of these little tiny mining towns, you know, but not a lot. Not a lot of civilization and a lot of trees. Yeah, a lot of trees and a lot of up and down vertical landscape. Yeah, that's where they get the term the hollow, right? Yeah. All of those uh, downward uh, bottoms where two peaks kind of meet, the trees, and I mean, they're really, you, you want to dig in over there. I mean, that's why the guys shine over there, right? Oh, there's nobody making moonshine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, nobody I know. <laughs> As a citizen of North Carolina, there's no moonshine here. <laughs> Just keep moving along. <laughs> nothing to see here <laughs> that is amazing man <laughs> you know, and, that, and that you know these encounters it's crazy to me that we talk about you know goofing around with the UFO over Hawaii uh, maybe it was this maybe it was an LED kite do you think these two guys didn't know what they were looking at yeah no no I mean, I mean, come on. Oh, maybe you saw it. Maybe you saw what? Why don't you explain it to me uh, better than Tino did? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, I mean, again, that's a daylight thing. Yeah, it's foggy, but it's a daylight. You know, they can see it. And he's describing how wide the nose of the creature is. So he's pretty close to it. Yeah. Yeah, if you could tell I got a fat nose, you're in good uh, yeah, you're, proximity you're, to know what the rest of me looks like. Yeah. You're close I thought it was to be worried. I thought it was interesting, too, that he said maybe it was a little bit uh, intimidated seeing them with big knives and bats. Well, they might have just been intimidated seeing them, right? Yeah. I mean, some of these creatures, you'd think that they don't see people. You know, they try to... When they hear it and smell it, they know enough to go the other way, right? They're so stealthy. Well, in their opinion, he shoved the tree over knowing they were there. Right. 
but yet they hadn't seen him, and they were under the presumption that because of that, he couldn't see them. Right. And so maybe he was just shoving the tree over to scare anything away that may have been there, whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then when they finally had this face-to-face, so to speak. Well, uh, you know, we don't know, Bill. These creatures, they could have great hearing, too. So they he- you know, could hear them talking. Oh, sure. So without seeing them and knowing, like, okay, it's some of those humans, they're uh, they're not good. So I'm going to knock this tree down to scare them away. <laughs> you know. Yeah, they're walking through my hunting ground, and I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> and they might be carrying more gun than they think they're going to need. Yeah, well, if they listen to this podcast, they are. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the Bigfoot standing there when he sees the frickin' weaponry. Oop. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Little Homer Simpson. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kev. So what do we got for it's a our great uh, account? Yeah, fantastic, man. I figured you'd like it, you know, oh, so I do bust like them it. out. I do like it. It's pretty close by. You know, close, close to home, close to home. And by, so we got some great listener mail. But before we go there, I did a little bit of fact checking in the background. And okay. I have bad news for you and I. We were both off, believe it or not, by a power of 10 on wow. our distance to the horizon. <whistles> so there's a there's a simple formula that's based on the height above the surface of the water. If you're looking out at the water. OK. Um, in feet. So, like, say you're six feet tall and you're standing on the edge of the water, it'd be six feet divided by 0.5736, and then you take the square root of that. So, if you're six feet tall, that comes out to be about 3.2 miles um, that you're looking. So, it's definitely dependent on how high you are up, right, from the surface. So, like, if you were on a hill that was, like, you know, 300 feet tall— then uh, you can see about 22 miles to well, the horizon. I, uh, okay, but from, quote, level ground right at water's edge looking out, it's only a little over three miles where yeah, something 3. starts 2, to 3. disappear. 3.23 wow. miles is the math. And then, of course, that would also depend, like, if you were looking at a sailboat with a tall mast. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The hull would disappear and then gradually the mast, right? Exactly, exactly. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. So I would have thought cool. it was much more than that. Me too. Like, But, you know, I'm looking out at the ocean a lot, right? And uh, I always think the stuff is further away. So, you know, like it says on your rearview mirror, you know, objects are closer than they appear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's, right. that's, that's so, interesting. No, that's a good little fun fact, Kev. Yeah, yeah. All right. So let's go to the mail. The All first right, note comes it. in from uh, David. From Eugene, Oregon, a beautiful town, and I have a couple of friends there. And my one friend's brother owns uh, a couple of pizza places there, gourmet pizza places. So he writes in about teams with Sasquatch mascots. And he says, hey, guys, our local single-A baseball team, the Eugene Emeralds, use Sasquatch in virtually all of their marketing. And he put a link to their online store, and I checked it out. They got some good-looking stuff, Bill. Well, I'm going to have—I keep saying I'm going to check that out. I wanted to check out that one in uh, Washington State. And still Spokane haven't. Community College. I checked out their school store, the bookstore. They got some cool stuff, too. Like what, shirts, anything? They uh, got hats with like a Bigfoot, uh, like the foot of a Bigfoot on it. And it says okay. uh, SCC, you know, for Spokane Community College. Okay. They got a shirt with a picture of Washington State on it, and it says Sasquatch State. You know, it's pretty cool. <laughs> like yeah, everything I, you could imagine college-wise with either Bigfoot or Sasquatch on it. Now, see, my problem is I like the nasty stuff. <laughs> I, I don't want some goofy looking Bigfoot, you know, with his eyes rolling around his head like a howdy doody. No, these aren't that. They're, they're pretty good. Pretty good. Any, do you have any Bigfoots carrying off uh, college students screaming and kicking? I didn't see that. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha, sucker. 
<laughs> but that's uh. David in Eugene, Oregon. Thanks, David. Thanks for writing in. And I did check out the Emeralds MLB store, and it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's super. Wow. Awesome. Thanks for writing in, man. Yeah. And our next letter comes in from Rick from Ohio. Yeah. And uh, I know you saw this one, Bill. Uh, the subject is Krampus, <laughs> yeah. our favorite Christmas character. And, uh, yeah. and Rick writes in, hi, Kevin and Bill. Love the podcast and was just listening to the most recent episode as I went out to buy some stuff for a home project. I drove past this decorative Krampus in a nearby neighborhood, and of course it made me think of you guys. <laughs> and Rick sent a picture of it, which I will post, and I have never seen someone with a picture of a ghoulish Krampus on their front lawn in the United States, and it said, Happy Grampus on it. So. <laughs> and he goes on to write... Hope you guys get a laugh like I did. I'm going to have to check and see if this house is on the list of child molesters and such. <laughs> so, Rick, we definitely got a laugh, and uh, I think the photo is great as well. Yeah, definitely have to post that photo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Can you imagine? I mean, I, really, I have never uh, seen a Krampus on anybody's house, lawn art, nothing in all my years of living. And we have a lot of Christmas decorations around here, Kev, as you know, and I've yeah. never seen a Krampus. No, I might be uh, working on one in the woodshop uh, this summer. Yeah, well, maybe that guy he, whose house he was looking at is some kind of Nazi war criminal or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Vern, I just can't shake it. I love Krampus. I love Krampus. I miss him so <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome stuff. Awesome stuff, Krampus. Uh, yes. I haven't seen a good Krampus since I was in West Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, I, I hope that's not Krampus flying over if you can hear it. It's the <laughs> uh, the local Apache helicopter squadron is coming over the house like they do some evenings. Kev, I can hear them right now. That is awesome. Oh, they are loud. I mean, they'll, they put 10 of, them, 10 of them come over in a V formation. Yeah. Like uh, bionic uh, Canadian geese. You know, it's, 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 I mean, to me, you know, we're, we're aviation buffs. I, I'm uh, a little bit jealous that you get to see these guys uh, so frequently. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, because, the best like, ones I are out at the coast, the uh, Cobra gunships. Right, you know the the four and a half seating two person gunships. The Marine yeah. Corps fly them down there. Shout out to our uh, Marine Corps veterans. They come down to Beach Bill daytime. Uh, I don't want to get them in trouble, you know, but probably two hundred feet off of the ground. Yeah, and you know you see them and they look over at you and that cannon on the front of the Cobra follows yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when they turn to look at you, the cameras, the guns point the at you too. Looks at you too. It's pretty <laughs> wild. Don't squeeze the trigger. I'm like, whoa, hey fellas. Well, I told you that night I was on the beach uh, surf casting, and that blacked out helicopter came over. This dude wasn't at two hundred feet, man. Yeah, I think a hundred is a push. Could be, could be. He came over my head, man. Uh, maybe fifty feet. Yeah. That's how low he was, man. It was unbelievable. Well, and speaking of blacked out, when these guys come over here, I mean, they got a couple of little lights on them, but you're not going to mistake them for like a news chopper or a <laughs> yeah. medevac. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, all right. Our last letter, Bill, this one's fun, comes in from Spencer from Sweden. Yeah, Sweden. Sweden. And he says, hi, boys. I've been following the paranormal UFO cryptid scene for about 30 years now. Mm -hmm. Stumbled across your podcast on Spotify. Just want to say what a fantastic job you do. Mm -hmm. Amazing reports and well put together. Very funny. And your listener interaction is great. And he says, just for your info, in from Sweden, and we here have lots of legends about trolls, as uh -huh. we call them, and he calls them Skogmanskor. <laughs> 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 he 
He says there's a good YouTube channel called Mid Sweden Begut. <laughs> that might be worth checking out. I haven't checked it out yet, Spencer, but I will. And he says, anyway, thanks for your time. Keep it up. All the best from Svadage, which I guess is how you say Sweden. Yeah, now I just did a loose interpretation of the Skog Mentor. Mm. And as best as I can tell, it means catch me if you can, fatso. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All Come right, over well, here, you little troll. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, that's it this week, Bill. And to our listeners out there, uh, Happy New Year. Second episode of our season three. We love you guys for coming along with us each week. And please give us a five-star review on your favorite podcast player. Those reviews are super important because it's the primary way that we get new listeners to subscribe to our podcast. And if uh, if we get new listeners, as we continue to do each week, we're able to continuously improve the quality of the podcast, which is great for everybody. So thank you so much. Give us those five stars. Yeah, folks. And if you find yourself like Tino and Reese, fog bound in the Monongahela National Forest... You want to make sure of one thing. Always carry more gun than you think you're going to need. Sleep tight.